Hi everyone, I am Tuba. For those of you who haven't seen me yet, I am one of the organizers of this course. I am a radiologist and I work in the uh, University Children's Hospital Basel. And this is the first seminar of our uh, open science course. Uh, this year, our seminar series will uh, be held as a part of uh, Reproducibility Journal Club, a Uni -Bas Basel chapter. And today's speaker is Valentin Armhein. He will talk about inferential statistics as descriptive statistics. Valentin is a professor of zoology at the University of Basel. And he also works as a science journalist and was head of communications at the Swiss Academies of Arts and Sciences. His research and tech, uh, teaching focuses on ornithology, conservation biology, and statistics. In recent years, he published papers on the role of inferential statistics in our per perception of a replication crisis. Together with Sander Grenland and Blake McShane, he wrote a call to retire statistical significance in the journal Nature, and that was signed by 800 scientists. So without further ado, please welcome Valentin. Yes, thanks a lot, Tuba. I'm just sharing my slides. One sec. Okay, so I already had the honor to, to, to give a talk last year in the same series, and um, that was inferential statistics as descriptive statistics. Um, I still have half of the sites which are the same, and um, but I gave it a new title, which is the replication crisis is a communication crisis. And I think I will tell you why during my talk. And let's start with uh, what the public sees from what we do. And the public sees, for example, um, I mean, we all eat at home or whenever we are uh, passing a day, we eat several times and all that we eat is either causing cancer or preventing cancer. And you might know that this is the classic sort of classic. I mean, all those nutrition studies are notorious for um, always telling the contrary of, what's, of what the last study um, told last week. And then you get all those headlines in the press like now, now chocolate is bad for you. Last day it was uh, good for you. And now what should we believe? And this is um, so just a summary of several studies. These are point estimates, um, so risk ratios. And you see that they uh, can easily lay on, on both sides of, um, of the effect of zero, which is the risk ratio of one here. So this, the, the public sees that. Is, does it mean what we do is bad? And I don't necessarily think so. So this is, um, I start with a quote from one of our preprints that um, came in uh, following actually our nature commentary that you mentioned, Tuba. So this is um, saying that re the replication crisis is not necessarily really because the science is bad. Um, because, and this is slightly cynical, um, uh, the publication of unreliable findings is unavoidable because, um, well, um, point estimates vary from studies to study. That's how it is. And the problem is if every new study claims to have found the truth and then the public sees those contrasting headlines all the time. Okay, so that's more or less what I want to, wanted to say in the talk. Thanks for listening. But um, I think I can flesh this out a bit more. And I thought let's start um, with corona studies because all those nutrition studies could of course easily, easily be um, studies, for example, on whether masks work against corona infections. And now if you go to Dimensions, which is a search engine listing uh, the recent 121 million papers, which is more or less all papers that all ever have been published, uh, you can list it by Altmetric score. And you might know the score. It just says how often a study was cited online, uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, news pages, newspapers that are online. And the first 60 pages, uh, first 60 places in this list are now all occupied by corona studies or studies related to, to COVID, which is a good thing, of course, because uh, it means that now everybody talks about science, uh, at least since two years. Uh, all of us are um, sort of experts in many things we are not experts in. 
And on this list, uh, the, th the third paper is the one I'm going to talk about. That's about the effectiveness of um, mass recommendation. It's known as the Danish study on mass, uh, appeared in early 2020, and is um, highly, highly debated, starting with a claim that the first author gave in New York Times. in which he says, um, first, he can give information based on a study. And second, what he can give for information is that wearing a mask doesn't help a lot. And this was, of course, taken up um, by other news pages. And depending on which party in the US they, um, they are attached to, you can read um, opposing things, of course. So um, no, no, no wonder that Breitbart said, um, this is one more evidence that we don't need to use masks. And then Forbes said, well, no, get over it. Masks use, uh, are useful. And um, all this discussion in the media, of course, led to this extremely high um, um, alt metric score. OK, so let's have a look at what the, the paper actually says. The paper itself is um, much more carefully worded than this quote in the New York Times by, uh, by the lead author. So um, if this quote is correct, he was a bit um, not careful enough, I guess, in this interview. But the paper itself is, is fairly is fairly is fairly good. So what they found is a point estimate of um, an odds ratio of uh, 0.82, which means that in those participants, uh, the ones that gave the gave uh, some reply, wearing a mask reduced the risk um, by 18%. Now you can already here ask, well, is this does, is this really not a lot, or is it about 20% decrease of risk on something that might be worthwhile, but this is the point estimate. And then they give the um, confidence interval, interval estimate. And this basically says that in some larger population, which might be Danish people or Copenhagen people here, or we hope um, just humans, um, the data are highly compatible with, a, with a about 50% reduction in risk up to a 23% increase in risk. Now, what do we gain from this information? Hardly anything, of course, because it's fairly imprecise and that's why the p-value is large. Uh, that's why it's not statistically significant, but the data are highly compatible with, I'd, I'd say, a large uh, reduction in risk if you wear a mask, but also strangely with a slight increase in risk. So we can't really say anything and certainly we can't say that masks don't, use, uh, uh, don't, uh, uh, don't work a lot because that's, the study is too imprecise to say anything like that. Okay, and this was then also discussed on news pages. For example, there's a nice blog by the International Statistical Institute in which a uh, Swedish statistician said that he believes, you can read it yourself, Yeah, so he basically says, we must look at more studies. We must do a meta-analysis in the end. And then personally, this scientist is more or less uh, convinced that there might be a substantial effect. Um, that's his personal opinion. I might tend to subscribe to that, but um, we don't know yet. Okay, and then also, if you're interested, check uh, another blog post which I wrote and which I was citing those, um, those studies. So this scientist, however, said our non-significant result said masks don't work, don't help a lot. And that's not possible to say something like that with a non-significant uh, non uh, non result. Nonetheless, about half of the uh, published papers that we checked, uh, so we checked actually studies checking other studies. So if, if you will, this is sort of a, a small meta-analysis, just adding the percentages. And about half of those papers said misinterpreted non-significant findings as meaning that there was no effect. And this is the, the, the commentary in nature that Tuba already mentioned. Um, I still somehow like the, the drawing because it nicely fits our title. So the poor guy with the statistical significant goes into the chamber with retired things. Um, I'm not sure 
we really caused uh, statistical significance to be retired because most people who used it before we wrote this commentary still use it. So I don't see, personally, I don't see a lot of change among um, older guys, maybe um, uh, younger scientists read it and then think something might change in the end, we'll see. Okay, so um, the starting point for our nature commentary was that we got increasingly upset about all those study making those um, what we call proofs of the null hypothesis, and this is not possible since about 100 years, uh, we know that uh, non significant results. Um, so absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That's a sentence that everybody should know by heart. Okay, and this can be really dangerous. For example, um, as I said, we started our nature commentary with, I think, mostly Sandra Greenland being really upset about this particular study here, which is about antidepressant use during pregnancy and autism. And now one must know that um, several studies have found about a 60% risk increase uh, in autism spectrum disorder when the mothers have taken antidepressant use. So if anything, there might be hints uh, towards a small increase or I don't know, small, modest increase in, in risk. And now the study more or less found the same. So it found an increase of um, an hazard ratio of 1.61, which is a 61% increase in risk. It found a confidence interval, interval estimates covering all from about no risk increase until a huge risk increase of uh, 159%. And nonetheless, in the conclusions it said, compared with no exposure was not, so this association is no association. And that's just an outright lie. So they, they can't, if anything, they have found an, uh, a positive association, but certainly not no association. And also they have, of course, a, a rather imprecise result, but um, all of what, all that is in their compatibility interval is on the more or less on the positive side. So, and if you want to check this out, go and visit this uh, nice paper from last year from our colleagues um, uh, presenting, a, presenting a compatibility graph. And here on the, on the lower part of the graph, you have the confidence interval, 95% confidence interval. In this case, um, just touching the point of a hazard ratio of one, which says no risk increase but going all the way up to a huge risk increase of 159% here. All those values are highly compatible with the data of this paper, given their um, model. And the, date, uh, the, the point that is most compatible, the, the hypothesis that is most compatible with their data and their model is what they actually observe. That's the uh, point estimate, and this is, uh, as in the paper, of course, one point, uh, hazard ratio of 1.61. And here you can just visualize such a compatibility graph or p-value function is very nice to, to show you that. Um, so the compatibility of the point of the values inside the interval is not flat. It's just it, uh, it decreases to the limits of the interval and further decreases beyond the limits of the interval. So also the values that are not inside such an interval are of course compatible with your data. They are just not as compatible as the values inside an interval. And we say a more correct description would be, and I really still hope to find such things in papers. And I must say, maybe the guys who, who wrote this mask paper that I showed you in the beginning read our paper and other papers because they actually, as I said, uh, their formulations in their paper is more, more careful and is very close to what I'm presenting here. So please write your study saying, given our statistical model, say what you found, what you observed, because that's your point estimate. And it's very likely not um, a risk ratio of zero. So it's either on, on the positive side or on the negative side. However, under the same model, and when you claim when you describe your point estimate, of course, you can't describe your point estimate without also describing some interval estimate. That's cheating if you, if you don't state uncertainty. Okay, so that's what comes next. Under the same model, every hypothesis from no increase up to this um, huge increase was highly compatible with our data. And then comes the most important part. After describing, what you, after describing your data and your model, 
you should, you must say what others said. And if the others said there was very often a risk increase of about 60%, don't claim that you are now the first one who actually shows that there is in present tense, there is no risk increase. That's simply an outrageous and dangerous lie. And it goes to the press and it goes to Medscape. So Medscape, that's what they say on their own webpage, is the leading online global destinations newsletter webpage for physicians, healthcare professionals. And then physicians read a sentence like, like that. Use of antidepressants before and during pregnancy does not cause autism point. Okay, I don't say I'm not a specialist at all in this. So um, maybe there really is no association, but everything we have so far rather hints towards an increase in risk, okay? So this is, uh, this is just dangerous. And this was the start of um, the story where we came to, how we came to, to publish this nature commentary, but there are many things to say and many things that have been said for since about the 100 years. So the criticism of significance testing of significance threshold is just as old as our significance thresholds at least the threshold of uh, 0.5 in itself. And this is an early um, meta-analysis by Ioannidis and Lau about uh, 20 years ago, and they nicely collected several studies on whatever, um, of course, highly, highly important antibiotic prophylaxis uh, in colon surgery. And just look at those point estimates here and the interval estimates. As usually, if the interval, if the 95% confidence interval covers the zero effect of a risk ratio of one here, that means the result is not statistically significant. And that means that the p value is larger than 0.05. And then you go through this list and you get non significant, significance, non significant, significance, etc about half of those studies are non-significant, which is fine. That's just how science works. What is, of course, what would, bad, what would be bad, and it's a communication thing. If this first study would say, we proved the, the, the worst word in science that I know of is two words, to prove. So we proved that there is no um, effect on, no effect on antibiotics on colon um, infections during surgery, after surgery. Next study would say, now we demonstrated there is an effect and so forth. So what would physicians do with that? Changing the, the habits every week or what? No, what in the end, I mean, why we do science is that in the end, somebody comes and uh, summarizes all those intervals here, does uh, meta-analysis. And in the end, I think um, it's quite clear that there is a positive effect of antibiotics. And this only works, of course, if this nice list of studies also includes all the lists that show either large imprecision or small observed effect sizes, both lead to high p-values and to non-significant results. And if you don't show those results that cover where the interval covers the risk ratio of one, of course, you will get an estimate in the end that is much more to the right than it should be because you don't have all the more right or most um, point estimates. That's why I put this here in italics. And as you probably know, the big problem is we have um, file draws. So that's a term that's um, is at least 50 years old. Um, there's a bit newer term, the significance filter. And this is a very nice paper from this year. Uh, for me, showing the, the most impressive evidence yet that um, the, the file draw, the significance filter, is leading to the file draw effect. So these are set values. So it's, um, in a, if you will, standardized estimates. And um, you can see that all those that would be non-significant, uh, because they are plus minus two standard deviations from the mean, are in the file draw and not in the, in the literature. Uh, so we could talk for, for a long time now about this, uh, but I, I really like it. I now show it to everybody I meet. The file drawer and the significance filter is a huge problem. Everybody knows that. And then there's a second thing that um, is highly problematic. So the subset of results that is significant in the end, that's the one that hits the literature, that goes into the public knowledge. These are, to a, to a large degree, overestimated estimates because 
if you don't have a power of 100%, and I never met anybody who had 100% power or not even 99%, 95%, if you don't have 100% power, the subset of studies that ends up significantly is, uh, has effect sizes that are better than uh, too good to be true. That's um, what um, Andrew Gilman also said in some paper. And uh, the picture that, that we get from scientific data is in most cases too good to be true. And that's just due to, um, to some filter that we use. For example, imagine we would now only we would do a study on, on leaves of trees in autumn and we publish only yellow leaves. Then, of course, what people who read papers infer from that is, oh, in autumn, there are only yellow leaves. But we all know, no, uh, reality is a bit more colorful. But um, whatever filter we, we actually apply is a problem. And in science, we have the problem that almost everybody I know of has a filter of significance. So, and this is a very nice study, um, the most famous replication study yet uh, from psychology. They replicated 100 studies and um, as usually in the in the original studies um, p-values are below 0.05 significant and in the replication that's not enormously surprising actually in the replications you get uh, p-values that actually range from one to about zero so uh, they of course not exactly zero but that's that's to be expected because um, because of things i'm going to talk about a bit later and since only those, non uh, those significant studies have been published, that means that in this first cohort of studies, there were overestimated effect sizes. And you can see this here, effect sizes. In the original study, the effect sizes were about double as, uh, as large as during in the replications. And for the replication, that's fine. So this, I would more, of course, trust those studies because they knew what they were doing. The sample sizes were a bit larger, probably. Um, but if people look at the original studies, and that's what usually happens, if, if, um, if very surprising results are for the first time ever published in Science, Nature, Cell, uh, whatever you have for journals in, in, uh, in your field, medicine, then you often find that the first published effect sizes are much larger than in the replication studies. That's just because of some filter that somebody applies, leading to a bias. And that's what I wanted to say. Then people say, of course, you are against p-values. Our nature commentary is, uh, I guess, about, I did not count, I guess about half of studies citing this nature commentary say that we are against p-values. People attack us because we are against p-values, but no, we write in this nature commentary three times that this is not against p-values. Because the p-value is not unreliable, it's reliably indicating the unreliability of our point estimates. So that's, um, that was a, what a p-value is, uh, is made for. It just says how, how compatible the thing the, that we observe, the point estimate, is with our data and our model. That's all the p-value was meant for. It's becoming a problem if we say um, out of this variety of p-values with doing many replication studies, they are, in one study they are large, in the replication they are small. If we then say yes or no, because the p-value is large or small. And we call this um, making decisions from every single study dichotomania. And doing this is of course having overconfidence. And that's already a first summary, actually the most important summary um, of what I think, I think science, and that's about communication. That's not necessarily about the methods that we use. Science suffered from overconfident titus and dichotomania, and that's a summary of what I just told you. Overconfidence and significance leads to the significance filter, also the overestimation of effects arising by the significance filter, also to the final draw, of course. Then if people on, on, on one side, they think if they have found the small p-values, they, they are able to claim the truth. On the other side, they, they are completely overconfident. If a p-value happens to be larger than 0.05, they make strong statements and they are just impossible statements like there's no effect. Okay, and then third, I think overconfidence 
and results leads to this partly wrong perception of the general application prices are coming get back to this in, in a sec. And fourth, we all know, but we in reality, we don't act like that. Reliable conclusions can only be drawn using cumulative evidence from multiple studies. And for that, it would be very helpful if you would have multiple studies that were not selected um, for some reason leading to some bias. And one of the reasons why results are selected is, for example, because some and very few, I hope, researchers want to cheat because of fraud. And um, one recent discussion, it's very recent, so actually from uh, this week and last week, was about um, a paper in um, uh, Nature Medicine, a commentary um, about ivermectin research. And it really seems to be the case that uh, in meta-analyses that have been published, they were tending towards saying there is some effect and that this effect really was due to one or two studies who are highly questionable. And if you remove those studies, it might happen what many people would expect anyway, that there's um, a very, very modest, if any, effect of ivermectin on, um, on COVID. Okay, um, so this is a, a screenshot from the blog by Andrew Gilman, um, the guy who's on the paper I was uh, citing in the beginning. Uh, probably one of the top, uh, at least one of the top known statisticians in the world and a very skilled writer. And he has what I would call the most important block in this entire discussion about replicability issues, reproducibility issues, if there's any difference. I think there's a difference, but that's maybe leading too far now. Um, and about statistics, of course. So it's really worthwhile. Ch I check this every day. Um, there are two or three block entries every day, huge time lag. So we had a, a, a um, discussion where we participated that was scheduled for the beginning of last year and just uh, appeared last week. Okay, so check this out if you want. And the, the, the commentary in Nature Medicine that I was referring to appeared last week, I think. The lesson of ivermectin meta-analysis based on summary data alone are inherently unreliable. Because what those authors, Lawrence et al., what they tried is to get data from those two studies on ivermectin that are questionable, and they did not get the data. So they conclude that we propose that clinical research should be seen as a contribution of data. Give us your data rather than your summary statistics. We don't want to see conclusions from your single studies. We rather want to see your, your um your description of how you collected your data and please your raw data because then somebody can really try to to look at, at the studies while um, doing a meta-analysis okay and then last um, month i think there was another paper that's again a commentary in nature um, nicely saying what i think and what i also taught um, uh, taught you during this talk expect less of one single scientific paper point. That's the big thing that's, and it's a problem because the incentive, incentives, as you might know, are um, leading and in, just into the opposite direction. Paper is the thing that, paper and strong conclusion is the thing we are paid for, but that's wrong. And somehow we should all work together in changing that. Even large studies, large trials in medicine, um, they are just one point in just one data point in the larger image. I'm sorry. Okay. And they say in this nature commentary, articles by individual research groups should thus be regarded as preliminary by default. And then they say, and that's um I so I was very happy when I read that because um we say it, many people say it. We say it since um, at least since 2019, the, and we, we, we framed it in one title of this paper, which was maybe a bit hard at that time, but I still think it's, it's probably true. There is no replication crisis if we don't expect replication. So the, the perceived replication crisis arises because people reflect to recognize that our statistical tests 
don't only test our single, and most people only test one single null hypothesis of zero effect. No, they test countless assumptions, the entire environment in which research takes place. That's more or less what all those, those other studies that I um, quoted uh, a few minutes ago also say. And then our um, final, my final remark, um, what I ask my students, what I ask myself and whoever I meet, rather than focusing on uncertain conclusions, we should focus on describing accurately how the study was conducted, what problems are, are, are occurred. Um, then, of course, we can give, I, I, I still think we should give our summary statistics, um, but we should also give the raw data if, if, uh, if possible for legal reasons or whatever. Um, and that's a strong discussion in medicine, of course, that is different from my field um, in biology, where it's not problematic if you publish, if I publish my data on nightingales. And um, one last story, maybe. Um, so problems occurred. One part of the problems is that one of the many assumptions that we have when we, when we do a statistical model is not only that there is some null hypothesis, but also random sampling. Does the, the, the study population actually reflect some replication we are talking about? Then all the assumptions that, that uh, did, are our measure measurements precise enough? Are our measuring devices, do they have a bias that we are not aware of? Or do they have a bias that we are aware of, but it's too expensive to, to, to change it or whatever? So there are tons of assumptions in each and every study. And all of them, if they're violated, lead to a small p-value uh, or to a large p-value. Just influence our p-value. OK? And um, that's a problem. And that's what I mean with um, discussing what problems occurred. And uh, I, once in my life, I tried to publish a study on the sex ratio in birds. So in birds, it often happens that there are male, more males than females. And then uh, with my two co-authors, we really thought hard for days what assumptions we actually have behind our entire study. And then we made a list that at some point, I even tried to make numbers to that list. So I think in the study we described in the end, we did not describe each and every assumption, but about 20 or 30 assumptions. And we, of course, we did not check all of those assumptions because that would be impossible. Nobody does it. Nobody even discusses those assumptions. And then guess what happened? Um, well, it's not published. The preprint is out. One referee had good things to say about the analysis. We need to check that. And the other referee wrote about 20 pages listing our 20 assumptions and proving us or showing us for each, each assumption that we did not really check this assumption. And therefore, he had uh, to decline um, uh, to, to, to actually reject or to, to, to suggest rejection of our paper. And yes, and then I said, yes, you're right. We did not check all of those assumptions because that's not possible. We just wanted to describe assumptions that usually nobody ever describes. But it did not help. The paper is still unpublished. OK. Then if you want, you can even check this out. So this is a web page, my web page then which I, to which I added this year a uh, page uh, reproducibility with a nice picture from uh, the beginning of 2020 from the clinical research day in Basel to which I was invited to, to, uh, to, to participate in a symposium here. And they so I did not make those uh, t-shirts, but they kindly provided me also with one. I'm the one on the right. And also my web page, I have um, two initiatives. One of them is the very thing that you are visiting at the moment. So we have, this is the first um, ever, as far as I'm concerned, the first ever talk in the reproducibility series, Journal Club series in Basel. So thanks a lot for the organizers for that. Um, there are now reproducibilities, I think, in about 150 or so um, institutes all over the world. Then we also have in my field, we have a new society that just uh, had the first online um, Congress a few months ago. And then we have in Switzerland, the Swiss reproducibility network. We are going to have our first in-person meeting tomorrow. So that's also a new thing. And I'm looking forward to discuss those issues with many colleagues. Okay, that's it from my part. Thanks for listening. And I'm happy to discuss all of it with you.